Hey folks, turn your great idea into a reality with Squarespace. Squarespace makes it easier than ever to launch your passion project, whether you're showcasing your work or selling products of any kind. With beautiful templates and the ability to customize just about anything, you can easily make a beautiful website yourself. And if you do get stuck, Squarespace's 24-7 award-winning customer support is there to help you. Check out squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, use the offer for code WTF to save 10% of your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com offer code WTF for 10% off. Let's do the show. The <laughs> All right, let's do this. How are you? What the fuckers? What the fuck buddies? What the fuckocrats? What the fuck? Publicans, what the uh, what the fuckicans, what the fuck publicans? What, it doesn't matter. I was trying to, I was trying to you know do the the two sides thing on the day after Independence Day. I don't know what happened uh, towards the end of yesterday. I'm recording this in the middle of yesterday. If the uh, if the civil war that Alex Jones prophesized came to pass, maybe everything's more in shambles than it was before. I think more than worrying about a actual civil war, it's a civil war you probably had to deal with at the barbecue or at the place you were hanging out or with somebody you're talking to. I don't know when that's going to end. Probably never. Today on the show, I talked to Peter Fonda, and I don't want to disappoint anyone. This was before he uh, impulsively expressed his anger on Twitter in a crass way, and it was, uh, you know, uh, startled and excited, the outrage machine. That happened after I talked to him, and he was on a bit of a time budget here, so we went, uh, we just went right into Peter Fonda land, and uh, I just, I jumped in. Childhood, 4th of July's came to mind, smoke bombs, trying to get a brick of black cats. I don't know how old you are. I'm 54. Apparently, I said I was 53 talking to Paul Rudd. I'm not sure. Why, if I was lying about my age, why would I only shave a year off? I just didn't, like, you know, I guess I'm having mild uh, moments of uh, brain skid, you know, as I sort of um, kind of like fall horizontally through time into it. But uh, But no, I'm 54. But... I just remember just like the mythical M80, man. Where do you get the M80s? Apparently around here, over where Sarah the Painter lives, M80s are all over the place because they're fucking, it's crazy over there, back in my old neighborhood. This neighborhood, not so much. Not so much. People are taking walks around where I live now, and it's pleasant. Is that okay? Can I graduate to that? Can I graduate to a place where people take walks? But man... I just, I remember seeing an M80 once, but never ever getting one. One time we got a brick of black cats with them all at once, and it was just a clusterfuck of random explosions. You didn't know where to run. It was your own little, very muted and harmless Vietnam, unless one caught you by the eye. You weren't going to catch any. You know, there was no enemy other than your hand lighting the fucking thing. But you just never, it was a rain of crackle. Yeah. I remember that. I remember smoke bombs. I remember snakes. I remember just hanging out in front of the house on the street. You had about a two block rain back when I was a kid where you could go outside and yeah, the creeps that kind of drove by. There weren't many. It was a neighborhood. It was suburbia setting up bike ramps on cans, doing that kind of stuff. I remember one time we made a, uh, a cannon. I don't remember who made it, but we made a, a cannon out of, um, back then it was tin cans, soda cans, I think four or five of them. And the bottom one, you had punched holes in the top. The rest were, were opened up on both sides to make sort of a cannon. And then you made a little hole on the bottom and you, you pop a, a tennis ball in and you shoot some lighter fluid into the hole on the bottom and then light it. And that fucking tennis ball would shoot like a hundred feet up. It was the greatest thing. I don't hear about them much anymore. I guess I'm not really running in those circles, but are there tennis ball cannons around anymore or do the cans not enable you to do that? I think it required a more durable can than an aluminum can. Yeah, smoke bombs, snakes, mythical M80s, the occasional black cat, sparklers, Mm -hmm. bottle rockets, the best. Yeah, yeah, and and the tennis ball cannon. Man, I remember we tried to hold that thing and it blew off. Almost killed Frankie Fool. I also remember playing chicken on the street and on bikes, on ride bikes. And for some reason, I, you know, I, I stayed in it and, and me and Frankie hit each other. And it was just this monumental dumb thing. 
You know, like, you know, it's like the idea of it. You play chicken and it's exciting, but you don't fucking hit each other just because no one's going to chicken out. What a dumb, dumb thing. This is before skateboards. But, uh, you know, that was my childhood. I hope everybody survived yesterday. We're sponsored today by Stitch Fix, which has reimagined how we find and buy clothes and can help you discover style you never knew you had. Stitch Fix understands that life gets busy, so they make it convenient for you. Simply tell them your sizes, your favorite type of clothes, and how much you want to spend. Your personal stylist will spring into action, hand-selecting five brand-new clothing items based on your preferences. Try before you buy, people. If an item doesn't fit, it or you just don't like it send it back free of charge and i bet you think this must get expensive having a personal stylist and all nope stitch fix is affordable the styling fee is only twenty dollars and it applies as a credit toward anything you keep you only pay for what you decide to keep so the pressure is off I got some new shoes, new pants, three new shirts. That pretty much has me covered for now, probably for the next year or two. That's the way I live. And the other great thing about Stitch Fix is you just get it when you want it. I don't have to do it again in a month or have stuff show up automatically. They let you control when you get it. Go to stitchfix.com slash WTF to get started now. Keep all five items in your box and you'll get 25% off your entire purchase. That's stitchfix.com slash WTF. There is two parts to this show. Remind me to tell you about Henry Fonda's boots. Okay? Just remind me. All right? And I'd remind me. Oh, the other thing is, I got a few emails tell- I, with, I think, Paul Rudd. I said, Bob Hoskins, the British actor, the great British actor, was a British Jew. It's not clear that he was. If someone knows otherwise, please tell me, because there were certainly several volunteers to tell me he wasn't Jewish. Not, and not tonally inappropriate. So that's good. I was going to tell you that I have uh, Andy Kindler here. Andy Kindler and J. Elvis Weinstein, Josh Weinstein, uh, they host the uh, podcast Thought Spiral. They have a live taping coming up on Tuesday, July 10th at the Hollywood Improv, if you're interested in that. And I'm always happy to see Andy. And he brought a guy with him. And we tried to have a conversation. I have to say, not tight on the promoting of their show. Uh, they might want to get that script down. But uh, always good seeing uh, uh, Andy. And it was good to meet uh, J. Elvis Weinstein, Josh Weinstein, again, I didn't remember meeting him the first time, but uh, here we are. Here we are. Me, Andy, and Josh. Why do you look so serious? Why are you guys here? What's this guy's name? J. Elvis Weinstein. J. Elvis Weinstein. How do you yes. get a name like that? Uh, cause I joined the guild, uh, with, and there was another Josh Weinstein. So I, I threw the, I threw the Elvis in to make my initials spell Jew. So Jew. <laughs> That, so that was, yeah. That's a good story. So you write for The Simpsons? Uh, no. See, I, that's why I he was, had to uh, do it. Mystery Science Theater and no. Freaks and Geeks. Those oh, my, the, but uh, same universe. Do I, do I yeah, nerd, nerd fodder, for sure. <laughs> if you were a what? person who was what? social what? back in the 90s, yes. and you were hanging around with me and my gang, yeah. you would have met Jay Elvis. Have I never met you? We've met a couple times, oh, but see, only in passing. That's, I'm sorry. That's okay. It's the that, kind of meeting where the, only, where the person less famous remembers. And I, I, I don't know that if it was in passing and it was a long time ago that I would call myself famous. Uh, no, you, I knew. No, I knew no, at the you, time. Would insist, you now insist that I call you famous. Well, that's a, but I think that's reasonable at this point. Well, it's, uh, there's already famous Amos. He comes along with, with famous the, Mark. Boom. Boom. <laughs> How funny am I in the have, morning? Have a cookie. You're great. Look at these three Jews here. Yeah, three Jews. Jews. Very much. It's a whole lot of Jew. Half a minion. Uh, <laughs> yes. You don't even, you know, the thing about. No, it, actually, it's not half. We need four and a half guy. We need another Jew and a half a Jew. Isn't it nine? I think it's ten. Isn't it? Is it ten? Since hey, when? Did they add one? Uh, maybe it's nine. I don't know. I haven't. I haven't. Had, it hasn't come up. So you go by Jay Elvis? I go by Josh in life. Josh but Elvis. My credit is Jay Elvis. Jay Elvis. Yeah. Jay Freaks and Geeks. Uh, Freaks and Geeks. One of the Mystery re- Science Theater. Mystery yeah. Science Theater. Cinematic. Titanic. Original Mystery Science Theater. Yeah. With Conniff. Uh, before Conniff. Even. Before Conniff. Conniff replaced me. Oh really? Yeah. Now, what are you guys doing? We do a podcast. It's just me and him. That's it. There's no guests. There's no anything. It's just and, it's called Thought Spiral, and we sit there for a, an hour and a half and try to make it work. But is it? What should it be called? Let's see if if uh, Josh can get a word in. It's kind of that. It's kind of running <laughs> alongside and just taking jabs when I can, finding the opening. So what's it called again? Thought Spiral. Thought Spiral. Now is this? Uh, uh, what, what, like, tell me about. Like what? What does that mean? Do you pick a subject? Do you? Do you? It is. Uh, there is no prep. 
It is a comedic life it's, dump. Please tell me that you use shitty mics and, uh, and yeah. no, don't no. record properly. Well, 58s. We use oh, 58s. That's, that's all right. That's all right. He lives three good. blocks away from me. So yeah. every Monday, I don't want to make it sound like a, a, a fam- so, we're family members. Yeah. But to, just in the fact that to get me to get me going in yeah. life, yeah. Uh, I, I go to his place once a week. Right. And it's a tradition now. But, but you did this before the podcast? No, no, no. This is how we socialize now. Oh, it, is. It, is people will, it is basically our friendship on tape now because so we you, don't talk in between shows. So you catch up. Yeah. He hasn't even seen my condo. You haven't seen my it's condo. It's like your show. Why did you invite me to your condo? I Can't know. That's the problem. I know. We, Who, whose Su- problem? Susan wants to invite you. <laughs> I say I can't take it. I get too close. <laughs> <laughs> We're asking for trouble. <laughs> we have Marin over. We, all, we should have a dinner party. We should. Ooh, let's, let's, that's our new podcast. You know, you know he's a very good uh, cook. I can cook. I like that. So now, like, I'm not, I'm not sold on it yet. Neither is any the nation. <laughs> Have you seen our numbers? <laughs> so, but do you like, like, for instance, how many have you done? For instance, sixty. Sixty of them already. Yeah. So how long has it been going on for? A year and uh, and ten weeks. Oh, so this is like a Hail Mary pass. You're, you're coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're doing a live show. That, and that's why we really do want to appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed the gift basket. <laughs> no, we're doing a live show. No, but Mark, it was really, I mean, to do, that when you said that you uh, want to help your down and out friends, I don't wish you had phrased it that way. <laughs> yeah, we're doing a live sh- live show, but yeah. somehow, I don't know, you said we put up a paywall. I wanted to put up a paywall. Yeah. He wouldn't let me. Why would you put up a paywall? I know. That's my excuse of why we don't have big uh, uh, numbers, because we don't have a paywall. Give me, a, give me an example. I'm sorry I didn't do, I'll do, my, I do my homework. Like, you want to yeah. do a little, uh, I'll do it right now. You ready? Yeah, this is the podcast. Welcome to Thought Spiral. Uh, I'm uh, your co-host Andy Kindler. Hi, Andy. How are you? Then that's about. So we go like that, and then <laughs> he doesn't even introduce us. He doesn't go, come in by name. Uh, uh, no, because we don't do it. We don't. We didn't even say his name. So you just said I'm Andy Kindler. Right. Yeah, because, hey, Andy. It, why? Would ne- it would never actually start like that. Is the thing. Yes, yeah, so I the wasn't. Thing. We actually just. Start. But do you have music? Uh, no, I pet his dog. Oh. And things like that. No, oh, there's so no you, music. Here's the, here, the the overall feel is it's meant. I, I mean, as deliberate as it actually is, yeah. which isn't much. Right. Is my hope is that it just feels like an ongoing conversation. Sure. People, you know. Yeah. People who like it say it's like having lunch with us, but yeah. they just don't get to talk. Oh, I get. You know? Well, but that's he, that is just like having lunch with Andy. Yes, exactly. I well, I'm, couldn't hear what you were saying because I was <laughs> coming thinking of a comeback. <laughs> you know, because you didn't have a headset on. But it's a yeah. lot. It's a lot of talking about uh, about it. I mean, it's really start. It's I, you know, a lot of it is just. You know, trying to figure out how Andy Kindler gets through life. Oh, okay. So, but do you do you talk about politics? Andy? Yeah. So what I, uh, what I talk about, <laughs> you sound like an old Jewish guy. You sound like an old Jewish host trying to get some energy going. <laughs> yeah. The guy who can't explain. He's trying it. to help us you, form a pitch yeah. for our Andy, show. Andy, now you. Uh, no, the thing is, really, kind of what started. Do you use a microphone? Yeah, we do, but we don't amplify it. Oh, that's very good. That's interesting. No, uh, I was, uh, a, and I think I talked to you around yeah. the same time. I had just gotten into uh, therapy for the first time in my life and I'm how many like, years ago was that uh, I think almost like two, two years, years. Two wow, years. Just like two years ago, year recently. Half, maybe. that's wild and I got into and I'm on Prozac yeah and so oh this has been and we've been friends for a very long time so it really is you us and talking uh, Josh J Elvis one yeah Jay Elvis <laughs> either one uh, <laughs> Jew Jew exactly. J Elvis Weinstein yeah and so uh, uh, we really do get to the point where I think we have interesting discussions, but uh, forget about how I said the word interesting. But the thing is, interesting. <laughs> but the thing is, it's the hard in a lot of ways. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. Yeah. And you say yeah. that when you see my stand up. Yeah, it's the hardest thing you've ever done. Yes. You say that this is the hardest thing you've ever done. When I started, because what you you yeah. and I don't want to shoot paint up your. Yeah, whatever it is. Whatever the saying is. Whatever the saying is. Yeah. yeah. But you I don't want to blow revel- marbles into your head. You yeah. changed my, and this is true, yeah. you changed my life. And I don't know if you remember this, but when I started to listen to your podcast, yeah. I was, I'd was i been watching politics. I couldn't get it out oh, of yeah, my head. Yeah, yeah. And so it was driving me crazy. Yeah. So I loved it when you would talk about your mom and yeah. talk about. So that's kind of what we're trying yeah, to do. It's your show, but the guests never show up. <laughs> <Yeah>. you, should, <laughs> you should introduce them at the beginning and just say, I guess they're not coming. Right. I guess Brad Pitt uh, d- chose not to make should it. Should we do that? that my initial, our, my yeah. initial thought was the Andy Kindler therapy wrap up show. Oh, yeah? Was. Well, what are you finding with the therapy? What have you learned, Andy, that's, that's been life changing? I have learned that I didn't realize that when I was young, yeah. I hated myself. Yeah. And that I hated myself for a lot of my own life. Yeah. Struggling with uh, liking 
trying to like myself, right. but trying to overcome hating myself, which was the internalization of the voice. Sure. Uh, 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 look, God bless my parents. I know my mom doesn't listen to this. Yeah. She was, she's a wonderful person, yeah. but, but sometimes as a kid, you know. Yeah, you need a little support. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, um. You need a little positive input. And the reason why I eventually, and the reason why I went was I kind of was hit rock, rock bottom with the OCD. Oh, yeah? And I was on Twitter all the time. With the OCD, were you just like, were you walking in circles, reorganizing things? No, I was oh. on Twitter. Yeah. Going to the interaction area, yeah. checking to yeah. see what people think about me. Yeah. That's the whole thing is that I, as I now stop hating myself, yeah. I am now able to like, accept feedback from my wife yeah you know because without I, being defensive yeah or? because she's not telling me i'm a horrible person yeah she's I, telling me I'm she a stopped terrible, doing that you know? <laughs> it's the subtext though it's still yeah. the subtext but. and he's very yeah, read between the lines Andy. <laughs> where now you would think we have a similar background yeah. but he's more see i see him as being a lot more well adjusted than me well yeah because it's a low bar I, well no i feel like you know right out of the gate i'm not feeling uh, exhausted by him see <laughs> see he's not demanding my attention right he's he's not challenging me to like him yeah he has his own it's self-esteem. the minnesota jew has, oh right that's the special brand the dylan style yeah he, Cone brothers i can't tell this you knew dylan's mother you did? That's true, yeah. She was, was at my bar mitzvah. Nah. My grandma and Dylan's mother grew up together in northern Minnesota. Yeah. Really? Yeah. And did my dad yeah. was a pledge brother of Dylan in college in Sigma Alpha Mu fraternity uh-huh. and tutored Bob Dylan in English. Really? Yes. Wow, maybe your dad uh, should get a, a little bit of money on the uh, back yeah, I end. Think, yeah, back I think, yeah. Really, yeah. I don't think dad he, gets him back He didn't do any of the rhyming help. Oh, no, think. no rhyming? <laughs> no. He didn't teach him iambic? No, I think it was freshman, <laughs> freshman comp, A-B-A-B. I think is what it was. Oh, really? Yeah. So was Dylan's grandmother a nice lady? She was. Beatty. Yeah. Beatty Rutman was her name was by her the time gr- I knew her. It, it was his grandmother? His mother. His mother. Was, my, uh, was the, a contemporary of my grandmother. Oh, I get it. I D- get Dylan it. Dylan and my dad are the same age. Oh, wow. Now, do you live up by where the Dylan uh, compound is or was? Uh, no, I live out here. And no, he, but did you grow up near it? I, you know, I don't know where the Dylan compound was. I grew up in a, a suburb of Minneapolis. But so, oh, oh, but that, that was where his mother lived? Yeah, his mother lived in... In, in Minneapolis? Yeah. Outside of Minneapolis? And then eventually, I think she moved to Arizona. Huh. Remember when we went out for that movie? Me and you? Jewish movie uh, for the Coen brothers? Yes, for a simple uh, man. For a simple man. That's exactly... A serious man. A serious, serious man. man. That's yeah. exactly That was my says. suburb. That movie was about my suburb, basically. Hmm. I love it up there. I take my last special in Minneapolis. I love Minnesota. I do, too. I yeah. like the people in Minnesota. Uh, uh, I think they're they're decent people. They're a good audience. They're pleasant. They're polite. It was a great place to start stand-up. Yeah, but I mean, the Jews are quiet and the Lutherans are, are pleasant. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it was a great place to start stand-up. It was, totally. Yeah. You were a stand-up? Yeah, I still am. Now I feel like an asshole. That's right. Well, that's because... How am I going to know? You, uh, because he started no. with... No, with Louis Anderson or before, uh, post, after Post Louis Anderson. Post Louis Anderson. I started, I was 15 and 87 when He's I started. 15 years old, he was doing stand-up in clubs. Wow. So, let me ask you something. Does, uh, let's go through some of the subjects that come up in a, in a standard conversation. You do a little politics. You talk about your, your therapy session. Music. Do you talk about music ever? Yes, because and he's been playing. He is a musician, and oh, I'm yeah. a musician, but... I, uh, I had, I haven't been bring, brought my stuff to the actual. He has good recorded stuff, uh-huh. and then we talk about like, yeah, we talk about like my original song I wrote uh, called Karen at sixteen, <laughs> and it was just a terrible song. You were sixteen, yeah, and, and he wrote, wrote a song called Karen, yeah, because she was had a crush on me. I, wrote, I when I was fourteen, I wrote a song called Jessica. I can't believe you started guitar that early. I started guitar when I was like eleven. Oh, okay, but you're better than me, right? Uh, this is the kind of thing that stop. This is another thing I learned from no, therapy, he's Mark. Not. No, no. There's a, <laughs> another thing I learned from therapy, Mark, yeah. was that uh, the reason why I didn't progress as a musician yeah. was because I hated myself. You know, Andy, and I hated my voice, and so you can't. It's like saying I hate myself speaking comedy. Yeah, but see, the thing is, is like you know, I, who doesn't like what? What good Jew doesn't hate themselves because of the expectations their parents put on them? No, so that's true. So what the problem is. Like, at some point, you got to push through the fear out of complete necessity, and then you get to the higher ground. No, but the thing is, at some point, if you say <laughs> right. you can't write songs, if after every song you say, you think this was, you say to yourself, uh, yeah. is this good? Do you think they'll like it? That's not the way Dylan wrote. You know, it's like, I'm not that way with comedy, but I used to be that way with music. So I'm learning mm. now why. Right. I was like, 
The reason is why is like if you, you jam with Amy and Michael once, right? Yeah. And then and Michael Penn said, <laughs> "What happened? You were jamming?" Yeah, I was like, just I was doing like a sort of a cock-driven blues lead. And he goes and said, so "What did he say?" <laughs> and he, he's like, uh, "I don't do that." Or I don't. And he goes, "Oh, we could do that." He said, yeah, we could go that way. So that's the thing. <laughs> My whole thing is I wanted to be a musician, but I want people like Amy and Michael to tell me I'm great. And that's what it wouldn't. It's that's pretty small it. audience. <laughs> <laughs> he is. Now he's a great singer. That's and he's great. Uh, uh, he, see, he, I, but I'm making me uncomfortable, Andy. I'm the oh. same way with music, though. I mean, like, I was never confident, you know, but it wasn't so much because I, I hated myself. I just didn't think I was good enough. That's kind and, of right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, like, in recent years, I've practiced and I've gotten better. And, you know, I still don't think of it professionally, but, like, Jimmy Vivino, let me sit in with him, you know, when, oh, they, yeah. when they do a blues night or something. And it's very exciting for me. And I still enjoy playing. And I've sung a bit out. But I was terrified. I had a bad experience as a teenager singing in public. It was very, to me, it's a very vulnerable place to be. I just never thought I was good enough, but you just, I put too much pressure on myself. That's I don't think it was self help. And it's hard as a comic, though, too, to be, to commit in that way. Yeah. To commit to that kind of sincerity. Yeah. That, to, singing. That, to, yeah. Singing. But some people, like, you know, some people like, uh, like, like, uh, Ackerman, they can just go up there and sing. Kid, Jambi and not Kid give, Jambino? Well, he's, he's, he's yeah. sort of a genius, that guy. Yeah. Uh, 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 he's something else. Uh, but, but you know, like, there are people that can sing without investing that. Right. Like, I don't know how to sing and just be, like, I, I, everything is so visceral to me and so close to the surface that I can't just put on airs and be like, Right. You know, like, you know, if I'm going to sing, I'm like, oh, God, here we go. Oh, that's, that's what, I'm, I mean, my, for me, it's been, that's been my lifelong battle is battling against self-consciousness. So yeah. now I get to, I'm now I'm at a point where I, I did a, the, a, a Harry Nielsen thing at Molly Malone's the other night. It was like a birthday, really? a birthday. You can sing like Harry Nelson? Well, we, we did a song. My Which wife, one? My wife, we did uh, You're Breaking My Heart. Ah. Um, so my wife and I have been in, had a band together for like 20 years. His wife the, is an amazing songwriter. Wow. Uh, and, you know, pe and we brought, you know, Paul Feig was our drummer for, for years, and Dave Gruber Allen was in the band. So it was a comic, and uh -huh. you know, it was a comic y band. Uh huh. Um, so, but now I felt like the other night we did this thing and we went up and we felt like we could just go do this thing, commit to it, not be pretentious, but still have fun. And, and See, it felt that, fun. It was fun. Well, that comes from doing it. Yeah. Yeah. That's my whole point, Mr. You Mark, don't do it. Is that, you no, live in your I head. could do it now. I'm oh. ready to do it now. If I ever, I, I'm trying not to hate myself in my twenties because it's not a, a positive emotion, but it's always like when you're in the mode of, am I good enough yet? You're Ugh. not probably good enough yet, but you have to, if you loved it so much, you'd keep going. And I just found that, that yeah. comedy was more uh, easier. Well, not, well at, <laughs> to start with, and it was frightening. Too. Yeah, I don't know what, like, I, I feel that comedy is so immediate that, you know, the actual time you put into, like, developing whatever it is you develop over the years doesn't feel the same as work. Right. right. And, and it, like, you know, if you have, if you're driven to do comedy, it's because it's like, all right, I, you know, I, I'm not, the, the waiting to get on stage thing at the beginning is horrible. But, you know, once you're on there, it, you know, here we go. That's it. Did you, you know? I cried though. The, the, the cried though. See, he started out uh, confident. I started out crying. Oh, I was terrified and like, you know, compressed and <laughs> angry. You cried? I cried because <laughs> I was in a duo and then the first time I went on my own. Uh, yeah. I on stage? Okay. No, no, in the car. Oh, so you should have cried on stage. <laughs> yeah, I had the uh, I had the complete uh, delusional confidence of being a teenager. Yeah, he was That's like a great. I never was a confident teenager. Yeah, the, the, I was. All, I just that was the thing that made me confident. Though was uh, oh, I'm a comic. That's oh, what that's I am. Not, that was finding, your thing. That finding was, that identity got me through the rest of high school. Yeah, I still haven't found my identity. <laughs> You're, You're still close. I'm close. I, I, still, I feel I very mean, close. I wear it. I mean, I like <laughs> I direct. Documentaries too. Yeah. In fact, I directed. You know, Lewis Lee. I directed this. I did a, a, a doc about uh, he, Acme? Acme comedy. Yeah, really. I, I did, directed. Did you? A doc did about, you? Was there a, a long discussion about why he banned me for twelve years? Uh, <laughs> no, but he let you. But he let you back, didn't he? <laughs> he did. <laughs> that is my class. It's unbelievable. Like Mark, uh, is, Mark is like me until uh, you know on my on my deathbed, which I hope they don't call it. Deathbed. Uh -huh. I, was, I, I go. I still feel. Lewis should. Uh, <laughs> he will not die until he gets through his grudge inventory. Andy, come here. <laughs> come here. Just, no, he apologized very nicely. Almost tell Gavin Pillow to go fuck him. 
I've been waiting to say that my whole life. Make sure you tell him. That would be who I would tell. But I really, well, he's a, I'm afraid of people like him. So, yeah, I mean, when, that's his uh, angle. Yeah, he's well, he's like a guy I think who beat me up. So that's always extra fear from me. So you never really seem to be this, sca- scared about getting beaten up. Oh, I am, but you know, like at certain point, it's sort of like I've learned to live with these things and and just move through some of them you, you know what i mean yeah. of course you know but but like i have found that most of what you're afraid of and reacting to is something your head is making up whether it, it's on purpose or re- right. reactive it's not real right. and like you have to decide like is this a waste of time and energy or is it not yeah well i've and also i decided through therapy this is why i say i'm the oldest jew to enter therapy yeah as i learned that uh me feeling ashamed because i avoided like mm-hmm. fights and yeah cr- maybe at three o'clock and i'd start crying right you know before the fight uh, be- no I, I wouldn't go to the other area to fight that's uh, the thing and but you I set felt- the fight up earlier in the day no i refused no, no, the guy oh. would torture me by that way so i thought that you have to fight to be a man and mm. now i realize that if i'm talking to a man if he w- if they want to punch me i don't I don't okay. necessarily, there's nothing I can do. In other words, like my fear is I'm going to knock on someone's door and go, please keep your noise down or whatever, and they're going to punch me. But, but but the thing is, but you forget that you're a comedian, and like if that ever happens, like, you, you know, like if if some guy goes, I'm going to kick your ass, you'll be like, really? You know, do we have to do that now? You know? yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, you know, you get out of it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Well, I'm a short though. You guys, well, I don't know how tall you. are. I'm not a fighter. Yeah, here, I'm going to say, I'm going to tell you something between you and me, and and it'll be on the podcast, and that, that I think will make you feel better. Ray Liotta punched you. Never been in a fight. Oh, I love to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is so great. Right. <laughs> I don't think you've been in a fight either, right? Uh, I oh, have, you were in a couple. But, See, we've talked about, but it, it was trial. bad, and I wasn't good at it. <laughs> <laughs> You're not a scrapper. I'm not a scrapper. You got you got scrapped. I got scrapped. I landed a couple, but they were very flailing. Wait, was it? Just, you've only been in one, one real with a stranger fight. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. It was probably was it messy? Like, blah, 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 blah. yeah. For my, on my end, it was. <laughs> well, how about you? Did you ever get in a fight? Nope. Wow. It was. I was at. I was at this party, and someone. Th- these two girls came in and went. Someone come quick. And yeah. so, like an asshole, I did. Sure. And like ran outside wow. and saw like two of my friends yeah. squared off against three of these other guys. So now I'm suddenly on their team. Yeah. And it's the Jew team. Yeah. Not the good team to be well, on in this yeah. scenario. Uh, they're <laughs> trying to decide who's going in first. And the, how are we going to do this? And the littlest of their guys yeah. says, says to the biggest of their guys about me because I was big. Yeah. Get him. Oh. <laughs> was it was just teenage shit, or it was. I was like twenty, probably. Yeah. Yeah. And there was well, noises like. Ah! I think uh, that came out of me. And yeah, stuff. yeah, it's always surprising. Surprising noises, <laughs> and fear and pain. Well, Andy, I'm glad you're doing better. Podcast sounds wonderful. No, wait a second, <laughs> that what do you mean? doing better? That was really sarcastic. Where, was I? Uh, was I out of the loop? No, I'm was just I going, in I'm the rehab? I'm, I'm no, following I know your you're lead. Saying. I was doing a bit on your bit. I'm, my uh, character is the downtrodden guy. It's good. That's what you've la- landed on? Yes. You, you're not sweating. You seem clear. You know, you're, you're I'm not sweating th- as much as I normally would yeah, be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like and you it. make me ner- You actually do make me very Oh, did nervous. I leave the air on? No, it's good. Six Hold th- on. Oh, has that noise been there the whole time? This is unbelievable. You will make the same face when you're checking the temperature. It only, it only hit the mic when you moved your head away. It did? Yeah. It's weird. I, I wonder if you heard that. Well, that'll be an experiment. Well, that's the thing people like these days is what? they like to hear <laughs> audio recordings with the air on, uh. and they like to hear. <laughs> and, when you, and when you don't air this, you can say, oh, sorry, it was the air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, please air. don't. What? You have to. Huh? Please. What? We're going to go back so far. Oh, and happening? Marin, remember? Yeah. <laughs> what's happening now? This is still my character. Yeah. No, we, you were great on Marin. All the energy puts all the energy. Uh, it all goes away right when the cameras go. <laughs> <laughs> it's an amazing, amazing trick that Andy has. He entertains I, the entire cast and crew as right. soon as action happens. Andy's asleep. It's over. <laughs> it's really kind of true. And I used to. Uh, <laughs> that's why when I used to audition, I would go in and go, "Look, I can't audition well, yeah. but can I say, hey, you have a nice, funny shirt on?' And hey, right. the show business joke. Yeah, that's what I've always been doing. And then they and go, then we, uh, "You ready to read?" And then spam. Uh. <laughs> Well, it sounds like you got to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, we do. We do. So, what are we? What are we promoting? The live show? Live show, yeah. That's on July. July tenth at the, the Improv Lab. What time? Uh, Seven o'clock. No guests. No guests. Well, good luck with it. Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, can, I plug, can I plug my doc too? Of course. Uh, it's called "I Need You to Kill." It's about stand up in Asia, and it's uh, available on Amazon Prime. Well, that sounds interesting. It is. Tom, Tom Segura. Big oh, yeah. I love Tom Segura. 
So wait, so oh, he did stand up in Asia. Yeah. Oh, and you went with him. I went with him and two others. Yeah. And, right, and, and Louis Lee. Movie. And who? And Louis Lee, which is what I was. <laughs> he was on. He was there too. Yeah. Why was he? Because he put it? together the tour, and and he ultimately produced the movie. Yeah. Huh. So that's why you're kind of backing off of any negative things about. No, I've known Lewis. I've known Lewis since I was 16 years old. That's I've known him since. Lewis used to pour me scotch in a coffee cup when he was a bartender. You can't <laughs> different you know, lo- different different liquor license. Yeah. Lewis, Whole different club. Lewis comedy uh, gallery had to fire me the first time I met him. I don't know what because I couldn't I, I couldn't follow him. the middle. Oh no, I don't know what I did to upset him, but we're good. No, he didn't know. Everything's good now. Yeah, we apologize. I've worked with him. I, I always never had anything against him, never understood why. There's never a reason been given. Probably had something to do with the waitress, but uh, <laughs> but uh, we, we're good. Very gracious man. And that said, like I'm, like I'm doing that. To, I don't know. To, you're wrapping up a thing that's a different type of show. It's like yeah, I'm, I'm wrapping up a thing where like we're, we're like I'm overcompensating. Yeah, yeah no, no, he's great. Could not have been. Like, it's like uh, it's like the uh, the senator from Nevada in Godfather Two. The Corleone family's a great family. <laughs> <laughs> They've done nothing but good things. Louis Lee, that's what show business should be more like. All right, all right. We'll have fun at the thing. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, so that was good. That was Andy. That was Josh. Uh, the Thought Spiral has a live taping coming up on Tuesday, July 10th at the Hollywood Improv if you want to go. So, Peter Fonda. You know, Peter Fonda, before I talk about Peter Fonda, let's uh, let's talk about uh, what I mentioned before, which is Squarespace. Today's show is uh, being brought to you by Squarespace. Many of our shows are brought to you by Squarespace. Our website uh, is a Squarespace website, WTFpod.com. It's time for you now to turn your dream into a reality in a way that's easier than ever. It doesn't matter what your passion project is, okay? Squarespace is the right tool for you to set up a site and showcase your stuff. Starting a new business, publishing your writing, selling your products, huh? Any of those things? Get it all out there with Squarespace. With beautiful templates created by world-class designers and the ability to customize just about anything with a few clicks. You can easily make a beautiful website yourself. Squarespace's powerful e-commerce options let you sell anything online and analytics help you grow your site in real time everything is optimized for mobile right out of the box and there's nothing to patch or upgrade ever buying domains is simple and you'll get the help you need with squarespace's 24 7 award-winning customer support squarespace empowers millions of people from designers to lawyers artists to gamers even restaurants gyms and yes podcasts head to squarespace.com for a free trial and when you're ready to launch use the offer code wtf to save 10 percent off your first purchase of a website or domain that's squarespace.com offer code wtf for 10 percent off okay all right so peter fonda uh second time i've met him i met him many years ago on the on a live taping of the alex bennett show and i was very excited to meet him because he's fucking peter fonda and because he may be remembered and mostly known for one thing, but it was a pretty fucking amazing thing. Easy Rider was a pretty fucking amazing thing. And before I even knew what the movie was or knew anything about it, back in 1969, 1970, 1971, I lived at 1204 Dakota, Albuquerque, New Mexico, in a shag carpeted basement, me and my brother. And on that wall, because I always was, I don't know how it trickled down to me, but I was a, a avid reader of Mad Magazine, and I, I must have been looking around because it was the time, 69, 70, 71. I was seven years old, eight years old. But for some reason, my mother and father, being the blissfully selfish and, and relatively permissive, I would say very permissive parents they were, maybe they just didn't get down to the basement much, but I had a picture of Dennis Hopper uh, throwing the bird, and, uh, you know, I had a picture of uh, the three of them, Fonda, Hopper, and Nicholson, That, and I had a mini bike, and I had that American flag helmet that Fonda had. I had another poster. I had the horoscope sexual positions. I'm not lying. I, and I was that age, and they let me have that. Don't, you know, don't, don't arrest my parents. There's a statute of limitations on that shit. But it was a blacklight poster. I did not have a blacklight. Does that comfort you in any way? But... uh but Fonda is is Fonda, and uh, he was very re- reflective about his childhood in this conversation. And again, this was before he kind of went crazy on Twitter in his anger 
uh, in, in his reaction to the policies at the border. And if you're a right winger listening to this because you want to hate buzz, or if you're listening because you want to dredge up some clickbait about it, uh, I'm sorry to disappoint you. It ain't here unless you want to talk about Peter working through childhood trauma and some uh, probably uh, well-worn Easy Rider tidbits. So I think there is a new one here about a beef him and Hopper had. So uh, this is me, Peter Fonda, talking here in the new garage. It was a tight talk. He had to be somewhere. He didn't seem to care, but his publicists were very explicit about him getting out of here inside an hour. Uh, the movie that he's in is called um, Boundaries, which is in theaters now. And here, oh, the, the, the Cowboy Boots. Well, I did a movie with Lynn Shelton down in Alabama, and uh, my character wore these brown cowboy boots, just classic lizard cowboy boots. And I, I was able to take them, and I have them. And I, in my mind, I thought, well, maybe I can wear these. Maybe there, there will come a time. I definitely wore cowboy boots in my past. Uh, a years I've wore black cowboy boots. I, I don't know what years they were, but I remember wearing them out to where the seams broke. So there was a time where that was okay. Black cowboy boots, Levi's, you know the scene. Maybe a Western belt. It's probably in college. It wasn't the tacky style. I was going for the rock and roll style. But nonetheless, I'm meditating on whether or not I can wear these new brown lizard skin cowboy boots I got. And that's just in the back of my head. And then... The car pulls up with Peter Fonda in it. The back door opens, and out of that back door comes the exact boots that I got. And it was then I realized, maybe it's not time. Maybe that time hasn't come. You know, of course Peter Fonda can wear cowboy boots. What else is he going to wear? But maybe it's not time for me to reintroduce them into my wardrobe, because they do uh, imply certain things. That you either always wore cowboy boots, cowboy boots or because you're not a cowboy, or... Or that uh, it's, just, it's just not time. It's just not time. This is me and Peter Fonda. So, nice to see you. Thanks for coming. Oh, yeah. It's my pleasure. I, uh, I think this is my first podcast. Is it the first? How about that? Yeah, yeah. right. Does it doesn't feel that unusual, does it? <laughs> I think I it's met you. a little cooler. Yeah. <laughs> I met you once. Where? Oh, you know what? It, yeah, I remember what it was. You'll never remember, but I remember. Back in San Francisco, I don't know what you were plugging, but it was a radio show, Alex Bennett show, in the morning, a live radio show. I, I, you know, I wouldn't expect you to remember, but you had a nice leather jacket on. I remember uh, complimenting the leather jacket. I don't know what it, when it would have been. It probably would have been in the early 90s. Um, uh, yeah, it could have been. It, it could have been like 96. Maybe. 97? I don't Probably know. 97 when I was uh, promoting Yuli's Gold. Yeah, man. That was, a, that, was a big, uh, that was a big thing. Yeah. That was like, he's back. <laughs> I, you know what? I'd never <laughs> left. I, I know. I know that. I, they love to say, he's back. <laughs> yeah, well, I did. You know, I was living on my own sailboat. It was an 82-foot, 20-foot of beam. Yeah. For so many years sailing around the Pacific. Really? Oh, yeah. And, of course, don't you know, everybody said, oh, he's just stunned out of his head out there sitting around. No. And uh, you, you don't pull over and park at night. That's right. So you can't be stunned out of your head. Right. You have to grab, now we have GPS systems. Yeah. So you have to grab the section. I'm a celestial navigator. Oh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead and make the shot on the on the, the moving deck of the boat. So. Yeah. <laughs> you can't be stunned. You can't be stunned, yeah. Well, I mean, but I mean, it would seem that being out on the ocean is enough. I mean, why would you need to be high on top of that? Oh, yeah. That's the trip. You've yeah. had... When did you start doing that? Well, I began sailing uh, a little boat when I was 11. Oh, so it's, uh, it was in the family. It was something you always did? Yeah. My dad uh, was in the Navy. Yeah. And so I, I had this little, it was called a cat boat. Uh -huh. It had uh, a Marconi rig, which is, you know, it doesn't have the gaff. Yeah. And it was like 14 feet long, 13 and a half feet long. Yeah. And... This was off the north shore of uh, Long Island, a place called Lloyd Neck. And I'd sail out there, and re you really learned how to get as close as you could on the wind with a very difficult boat. Right. Uh, with no jib. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The main miss is just way up forward. So you get a sense of it. Yeah, you learn a lot about yeah. it, uh, making way and and not being able to get very close on the wind. Yeah. So that that's how I started there. And, then, uh, and you loved it. I loved it. I, I got a sailfish. Yeah. And uh, then we went over to the Mediterranean, and my father had it shipped over. 
Only problem was the French people wanted me to put a French flag on it uh-huh. because it was an American hull. Uh-huh. <laughs> this is a bloody sailfish, you know. It's like a surfboard with a sail. What do you mean I need a flag on this? Holy was, moly. Was that a problem? Was it an international incident? No, I mean, I just didn't, I ignored them. Did you, what, you lived over there for a while with your family? Yeah, my father, my second stepmother, and my How many were there? Jane. Five. Five stepmothers? No, no. no. Four. <laughs> Uh, three <laughs> stepmothers for me. Yeah, but he was married five times. Oh yeah, and you, oh, you and Jane and the, and the second stepmother were in, in the Mediterranean in France. The second stepmother, yeah, yeah, it was in France though. It was in France. It was Cap Ferrat, uh-huh. which uh, I mean, Picasso had a villa out the end. Oh yeah, and <laughs> there was a, a Swedish a summer school there. Yeah, with all these Swedish kids, yeah. including. including uh, Carl Gustav, who is now king of Sweden. Oh, he was there, huh? Oh, he yeah, was the absolutely. kid. And you were going to school there? I was, no, he was. <laughs> I, I was just trying to figure out how to stay my, keep my head above water in this <laughs> mad family. Yeah. Uh, but we would invite all the kids down to uh, the villa where we were staying because yeah. my dad would be gone with my second stepmothers, and that was very good. Yeah. It was so, good when he was gone. We had these kids from yeah. the Swedish summer school, they were there. And, um, uh, Couple of good looking gals and Carl Gustav. Yeah. He must have <laughs> the been king. 15. <laughs> yeah. I was 17. Yeah. And at one point, there's this image coming, coming through the hedge is Greta Garbo. Really? Now, Gustav does not know. Yeah. yeah. Carl Gustav has no idea. Yeah. That this is Greta. Yeah. Um, she's got a bathing cap on. Yeah. And a big tear cloth robe. Yeah. And she walked straight over, said, I'm going to go swimming now. I said, yes, it's perfectly <laughs> fine. And she just took off the tray cloth totally naked. No. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and by that time, when she talked to me, yeah. Carl Gustav realized it was Greta Garbo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. Jaw dropped, and she got in, did 50 laps, got out, put her bat, and went back. <laughs> she was coming from John Gilbert's uh, a villa. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> oh, there was some amazing stuff happened. And th- that gives me something that I can talk about in a good way. Yeah. There was a lot of real bad shit that was going down. In terms of your family? Oh, yeah. Yeah. But uh, what was it? The old man was just an abusive dude? Uh, no, not really. Oh. Uh, his... Um, I think he was extraordinarily shy, uh-huh. and he had a difficult time expressing love. Oh yeah, in the sense that, uh, you know, he didn't. He he became uncomfortable when he felt that he had to put on some demand. He had to respond yeah. to some demand, and that wasn't really what was happening. Yeah, but I, I, regardless of how tough things were in different times, I'll tell you what. I grew up the first. Eight years of my life, yeah, I knew nothing about race or color. Yeah, I had no idea. Sure, first um, African American I saw was Nat King Cole. Oh, so he's the first black man I seen at your house. At my house, yeah, at, we had twelve acres out on uh, uh, on Tiger Tail, just out in in Brentwood, but up in the hills. Yeah, and they, they had some parties that would come up. Sure, there. yeah, and one of them. Was this guy? I'd never seen him before. I'd never seen a black man before. Yeah. I thought remarkable looking guy, and then he smiled. He was and he was just around with everybody else. Sure, he was a guest. Yeah, and, but he sat down at the piano. Yeah, and began to play. I bet. Yeah, and it was beautiful. Amazing. I had to take piano lessons. Sure, I'm looking at, I'm so left handed, and I'm looking at 88 keys of right handedness. Yeah, <laughs> but this guy's he's doing. He's smiling up at me. You know, yeah, his yeah. smile is just. Yeah. Explosion of right. teeth and white. And, yeah. and um, I was staring at him and he said, do you play? I said, well, they make me take lessons. Yeah. And he got very serious. He said, you know, never look at, at playing an instrument like somebody's making you play it. Yeah. You got to think you want to play it. I said, well, sir, uh, I'm very left-handed. And there's 88 keys of right hand in this. He looked at me. He said, watch this. He crossed his hand over and plays Cow Cow Boogie. Yeah. And then he taught me how to play Cow Cow. Because Boogie Woogie, uh, up here is going ching, 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 ching. Down right. is the run is down in here. The port stuff's left-hand. on the left hand. Yeah. Yeah, so, right. The, the whole thing is I, on the I left hand. I felt like such a fool had I only known <laughs> it was Boogie Woogie and not, you know, Mary's Dotes and Old Dotes and Lillian Yeah, yeah right. So I, that must, that's a great, uh, a great lesson to learn. Oh, uh, well, I did tell him uh, a little bit later that the first piano recital I had to do, 
uh, the song I was playing was Ladybug, Ladybug. Yeah. And so as I was playing it, I wasn't singing. Yeah. But I was singing Ladybug, 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 Fly Away Home. Yeah. Your house is on fire. Your children will burn. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. And in, in a sheer terror i ran from the stage right it's a little, it's a little recital you know right, right, right. five years old or something. blew your mind well yeah I mean, yeah fucking disturbing that is like you rock a bye baby in the treetop yeah yeah when the wind blows the trade will the rock. rock yeah the kid's gonna when fall the bell on. breaks the, yeah. <laughs> the cradle will fall and now i'm just, whoa i too, you know what i don't like this idea of falling <laughs> breaking i have it's too heavy man whoo. yeah too heavy <laughs> oh man well, i'm glad to know that your dad was shy because i got to, i don't know the whole history uh, of of your family but like there's that and what fucking movie was that he did with charles bronson the one at the end where he sticks the harmonica in his mouth i can't remember but it was like he had this look in his eye he was the heavy your old man frank was. his name was frank yeah yeah fucking just terrifying and i'm like oh man i hope that's not what they had to grow up with <laughs> <laughs> no uh, but <laughs> you saw it sometimes well yeah, yeah. uh i remember you know that there were lots of, of famous people that were around all yeah. the time Jimmy Stewart, you sure. know, is his dear friend and had been for such a long time. John Wayne, yeah, Ward Bond, the, uh, uh, Randolph Scott, some you know, yeah. some, some good people in westerns and other times. Yeah, yeah. And one morning, I remember coming down for breakfast, and there was Ward Bond and John Wayne, yeah, hanging and, out, and we're having breakfast. We all get, and the Duke had a Cadillac, a four door Cadillac convertible, yeah. It was a cream-colored car with red leather seats. Yeah. Years later, I reminded him of it. He said, my God, you remember that? Yeah. I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I remember this and I remember that. And they were uh, finishing a film called Ford Apache. Oh, yeah. Which was a John Ford film. And it was Ford's version of uh, Custer's Last Stand. Yeah, yeah. And my dad was Custer, but he was called Colonel Thursday. Uh-huh. So when people say, what was like? what was it like growing up with your father? I said... Did you ever see Fort Apache? <laughs> Colonel Thursday? Yeah. That's what it was like. Because <laughs> he plays this ramrod, terrible person. It's yeah. just, he deserves to get killed in the end. <laughs> yeah, man. I can't, like, it's like, he but must be. You know what? Yeah. That one lesson, no bigotry, no racism, I didn't know. Yeah. I had no idea. Sure. So you, you, so. I mean, yeah, there was somebody very different in that King Cole. Right. But he was a person. Sure. Yeah. So you, you didn't learn it. You, 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 in other I learned words, nothing to hate. Right. So the, the being a sort of a, a insulated in a, a kind of Hollywood world, you weren't given any hate. Never got it. Yeah, it's nice. You know, and we weren't that insulated in a, a way. We would see different people come in. They were all people. Yeah. To me, Pedro the gardener. Sure. He spoke a different language. Well, I tried to learn to talk with him, but yeah. he could speak English, too. I had no idea that he was Mexican. He right. just spoke differently. Yeah. We all look alike. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. Well, it's good when you're a kid and you can hold on to that mind. You know and what we, I mean? And we had a Japanese maid and we hid her during the war so she didn't have to go to detention camp. Oh, yeah? Yeah. So, and of course, I didn't know anything about that from I was one and a half when uh, oh, really? I went to war. When, yeah. When my dad went to war and I was three years old. And then he he was in the Pacific as a sailor. Yeah. He was already an actor, right? Oh, yeah. He had been an actor. It was very successful. We had 12 acres of land up in... It was, in Brentwood. Yeah. yeah. He'd been around a long time, right? Did those... We okay. say yeah. um, at, at most times during the war, they were called victory gardens. Yeah. Everybody was encouraged to grow some food for themselves. Right. We had a truck farm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there was every <laughs> yeah. vegetable you could imagine. And my yeah. dad made all the dirt yeah. through composting. Yeah. So I thought his job, but I had no idea what he was doing. Yeah. I thought his job was making the best dirt in the greater LA area. <laughs> and it was really good dirt because we had great veggies. Right, right, yeah. So, like, when you, do you live here? You have a house here? Do you have a place? I have. I'm, I, I'm out, uh, I call it in the wilderness. I'm on the west side. I look down and see the back of the Getty Villa. Oh yeah, and then out and see the ocean and the Palisades. Oh, that's beautiful. Castle and Mary. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. And but so you don't have the place in Montana anymore? No, no, no. I I decided. You know, uh, well, what I say yeah. is I don't want to see the mountains anymore. Right. I don't want to see snow. <laughs> I don't want to try to blow snow out of a quarter of a mile long drift that's ten feet high in the center. <laughs> no more of that. I, I don't want to see the wind bringing dust through the logs of my house. <laughs> yeah. I don't. Th I don't want to wet a fly on the Yellowstone River. Yeah. I don't want to. Uh, however. Yeah. 
if there's film in the camera and money in the bank, what time do you want me there? <laughs> <laughs> right. I'll fly. Very I'll practical go. about yeah, that yeah. part. So but, when you grew up here, though, like at what point, like, because I've talked to guys, like, because you talk about your dad's friends, but, you know, you had a whole crew, too, from the late 60s and 70s that were equally as, you know, kind of um, important in the in the big spectrum of uh, show business and movies. Oh, and, yeah. yeah. and counterculture. And a lot of those guys, they're, they're, they're going away, too, now. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, it's the thing about getting older, you I lose know. more friends. But. I know. It's so sad, right? But, but in a way, I know it's coming. Yeah, right. We you all know, know it's coming. People say to me, oh, <laughs> yeah. and how are you today? Yeah. I said, I'm alive. Yeah. And they think I'm being cynical. Right, right. I said, no, the alternative yeah. sucks. Yeah, I'm on the right side of the grass. But yeah. uh, although it's inevitable, yeah. at this moment, unacceptable. Right. So we keep trucking. That's right. Yeah, that's <laughs> now, true. So if the drive-by hits me and I'm out... It's been a hell of a ride, man. Right, it has been, right? <laughs> yeah, you, you bet. <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, like, I I try to get a sense of what what what's interesting about Hollywood and about show business is that you know when your dad was around, it was it, it was just a it was like what three four studios, and then when you like started coming up, it wasn't much bigger, just a new generation of people, but it was still a small town kind of thing, wasn't oh, yeah. it? Yeah, it was. And it must have been like it, it, a, like everyone. I feel like there was a real community, and everyone kind of knew each other. Everyone knew it what did. was up. And in the sixties and the late sixties, like you must have felt that um, like when things started to shift because you did a couple of straight up. What were your first movies? Uh, Tammy and the Doctor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then the Victors. Uh, <laughs> yeah. War as Hell movie. Yeah. But it was yeah. like those were straight up studio movies. Kind of. Um, yeah. yeah. Universal and Columbia. Right. And then, like, I mean, so you were just at that pivotal point where shit started to break apart, right? You felt oh. it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, shit actually started breaking apart when I was six years old, but we don't want to get into it. Sure, we can get into <laughs> I it. No, you don't want to. Right. I promise you. It's In 2004, I found that the name of what was f- fucking me up. Yeah? What? Post-traumatic stress disorder. Really? I had no name to wh- why I was so fucked up. Really? Yeah. And, and what's that track to? Like, from what? Well, uh, it starts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. It starts when I was thrown out of a barn window and fell 18 feet to the ground, a hard packed ground on my chin, and oh. broke my neck. I didn't know I'd broke, broken it until 85 when it broke it the second time. Really? Yep. Yeah. Who threw you out of it? The older boys who really? were jealous because I was Henry Fonda's son. Uh-huh. And I mean, that's how I was described. Yeah. I had no idea who he was, so that was hard identity to live up to. Whatever you didn't have a sense of how how big he was or what you know he did no, really. I, yeah, I, I knew that he made movies, and uh, I just didn't know how that worked. Uh-huh. He never talked about it. He never talked about his job. You yeah, know? Uh, we knew that he had friends and they were all making movies, but we weren't sure what movies were. You have to remember until nineteen from forty, basically, I was born then and. and those first years of my life there was war yeah right and rationing and all that yeah so we had only a couple of uh friends that we could visit with right um the leland hayward's three children she he married uh margaret sullivan who was my dad's first wife uh-huh. this gets really weird, weird. <laughs> but, and uh, so, they had three kids and yeah. so they were like our best friends we were either at their house or they were at our house and yeah, he stayed friends with her all that time uh yeah, yeah. and and uh, leland had been his agent uh-huh. and went, leland sold his agent's list to uh lou wasserman and jill stein at mca and when they came out from uh chicago oh, yeah right? And that that was a bunch of incredible actors. So Washington was an agent before he was the head of... Uh, he was a music... Uh, but it was all about music oh, yeah. and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And they decided where they wanted to be. He was in Los Angeles, and they wanted to make movies. You know, I'm glad they did. Yeah. So those were your peers. Those were the people that were hanging around. And then those, and then they threw you out of a barn. Well, you know, I was sent away to school. Yeah. Um, I was almost 10 pounds when I was born. A uh, big boy. And I was in New York for eight and a half weeks. Yeah. Now, there was nothing wrong with me. I was yeah. a 10-pound baby boy. Yeah. But my father, when he heard about it, was hooping and hollering around the set of whatever movie he was making. And I probably would know, but I, I just preferred not to know. Yeah. I not to say. Um, saying, oh, boy, I've got a fullback for a son. <laughs> right. Well, I was 
10 years old, I was almost 10 pounds still. <laughs> so I flunked that one right out the gate. No, no wanted, back. No, they wanted me to, to, you know, become more of a man. I mean, shit, right. I was six. Yeah. Can't you let me be yeah, six? Yeah, yeah. No, they packed me off to this boarding school up in Topanga Canyon uh-huh. in 1946. And, uh, yeah. So. Not too far from home. Uh, for me, it was like the other side of the world well you were living in new york then no he was no no here. i was living here but it was still <laughs> uh, and, and we we lived in this beautiful low top yeah a lot of sun uh, big fields yeah f- uh, orchards and yeah. stuff yeah. Veg- veggies as i've told you and just great to this little school up in topanga uh which was really weird uh, to me i was wondering why are we living like this yeah to the floors. Was it like an outward bound kind of thing? Was it supposed to toughen you up? It was that kind of school? Well, that's where they they sent it to toughen yeah, me yeah. up, but it was just a school where yeah. uh, people in the industry or famous people dropped their kids. Oh, yeah. And, and that's where you got hurt? Yeah. And, um, and that's where you track the post-traumatic stress to? That's the beginning. Yeah. Uh, it was compounded yeah. uh, later that very year. And 46 was a hell of a bad year for this mm-hmm. boy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um at any rate, let me just say that uh, I was I flew back east with my mother. Yeah. And um, I thought, oh, I'm going to go to a hotel. I've never been in a hotel high school. And uh, I'm looking at this taxi cab far out. You know, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, right. What do I know? Yeah. And uh, later, I would find out there are people in hotels who come out and get your bags and help sure. you. Yeah. But my mother had her little case, and I had my little, you know, small case and a teddy bear. Yeah. And I'm wondering, wow, you know, this, all this brick this is far out. And, right. You know, and walked up these stairs and then I flattened up more stairs into this. Is this the lobby? <laughs> right. <laughs> I yeah, nothing. Yeah, yeah. It was just all these incredible floors. And remember, my mother said, and I can, as I'm telling the story, I can actually see her. Yeah. In a black dress, black hat, and a wide mesh veil. It was just kind of the, the thing then. Yeah. And she said, you, you stay right here. Someone will come and get you. And, I watched her go click, click, click her heels. I could hear them hitting the floor as she walked away. And I didn't know. I said, somebody's going to find me here. Yeah. Well, I have my bag and my teddy bear. What the hell? And somebody finally came along. Right this way, I got an elevator. I've been in elevators before. Sure. They took me into my hotel room, which was a funny green paint on it. (laughs) It had a bed with this metal table that swung over the bed. And I remembered the table when I lost my tonsils. I was three years old when they took my tonsils. Yeah. So far out. You didn't know you were in a hospital. No. I I remember this kind of bed. Why were you there? Because... I was so skinny, they thought that I had a tapeworm. Uh-huh. So, yeah. <laughs> so all you have to do is to put two and two here together and figure, how are they going to figure out if I have a tapeworm? Sure. Where are they going to go looking? They're going to go digging around. Where? Yeah, in your ass. There you here. go. In and so ass. I was mechanically raped when I was six years old in yeah. John Hopkins Hospital. Fortunately, those guys are all dead now. Otherwise, I would be a known murderer. <laughs> <laughs> I would go and shoot those those bitches. I tell you, that was strike two, huh? Uh, well, yeah, they didn't give me a shot of anything. I'd remember. Uh, I, see, I'm into the details, which yeah. really drives my family nuts. You, you keep hold on to it. <laughs> oh, I don't hold on to it. I just it's just there. Yeah. I mean, I wish I weren't holding on to it. Yeah. So it was 2004. I figured out. Oh, no, it was actually a psychiatrist who yeah. said, well, "Don't you know what's going on?" I said. No, I really don't know what's going on. I'm really fucked up. And I, I, she said, here's what it is. You had all these things happen. Your mother died when you were 10. You probably went on and on. And, oh, she did? When oh, you yeah. were 10? That's big. Yeah. Um, she died of a suicide, but I didn't know it then. Yeah. I wouldn't find out about that until I was 15 the first time, then 20 uh, where she yeah. died and then 25 how she died so every bit every time I was being slammed again this, this, yeah. yeah because there was no word yeah. she died and her name was never mentioned again in the house right because your, your old man just shut it out yep yeah and uh, you know so that messed up a lot of shit in my life yeah. and then other things you know I'm, sure. hey I'm very fortunate to be here uh, I've dodged so many bullets yeah when I was a month shy of my 11th birthday, January 9th, 1951. Right. Uh, it was a Sunday. Yeah. And I was going trap shooting with two other young boys my age, Tony Avery and Reed Armstrong. And uh, it was on the Kresge Estate in New York. 
Mm-hmm. So we went from Greenwich, Connecticut over to the Kresge estate and Reed Armstrong had brought this little pistol with him, a little twenty five caliber, you know, single shot break yeah. open. And uh, so we wanted to shoot it, and I did. And I didn't understand the pistol thing. I understand rivals and shotguns. So I put the shell in, and you're supposed to cl- the opening to eject the last the spent cartridge. Yeah. And then you put the new one. That's cocking the gun. So instead of doing it smoothly, I keep in a hand of the barrel and hand on the handle, the, the pistol grip. Yeah. Uh, I just slapped the barrel to go up. Yeah. It did spun in my hands and blew off right into. It blew off the tip of my liver to the top of my oh, stomach God. and center punched my left kidney. Jesus, man. So basically, I died three times on that operating table, lost too much blood, my heart stopped. Ah, oh, fuck. And uh, it's a wonder timing. Yeah. Um, I went and met the doctor later. Yeah. When I was 21, I, I went up and drove up to see him. Uh-huh. Uh huh. His name was Charles Clark Sweet. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Sweet had told me that they saw this blood and they didn't understand about the tip of my liver being blown off. Uh-huh. Uh, and they just thought maybe my aorta, uh, my abdominal aorta was hit yeah. or my heart. Uh-huh. Because in the one they were looking through to try to trace the bullet, right. the bullet was stuck on the su- on the end of uh, on my skin, on my right. back. Yeah. It had to be cut out. Yeah. It was just lying flat on it. And as they were trying to trace the shot, the heart, it was the heart and the abdominal aorta kept coming in because the the heart's a a mup, uh, it's a muscle that pumps. Yeah. It contracts. Yeah. Contracts. Yeah. So the bullet hit my rib cage. This is told to me, I mean, I didn't know, right? Yeah. Charles Clark Sweet told me. Uh, It hit my rib cage and started tumbling. Uh So the heart was just that part of the ventricle that was contracting. Cl- contracting, yeah, bringing everything, lifting the aorta up, yeah. and the bullet went flipping by. It, that's called timing. Yeah. <laughs> now, yeah. when does that really play? Yeah, yeah, that played pretty heavy. Yeah, right. <laughs> but here, here's the out, here's yeah. how I get out. Yeah, right. In 1965, David Crosby called me. I just come on over. We're uh, we're going over to see the Beatles. Yeah. They were up on Bennett Canyon. Right. I said, cool. Yeah, man. Do you want me to bring anything? <laughs> he said, no, no, I'm bringing it. No, no David I'm bringing the best it. of everything, right? <laughs> so I, mean, I drove I'm up. I had an, an E-Jag. I thought, well, I'll come in that. British racing grain. What Is your fuck? car? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I pulled in. I knew yeah. the password. Yeah. I mean, the hills were alive with the kids. I it bet. It was pretty frightening. But... We took acid. So, so you go to Crosby's house and you take acid? No, we go to the the house the Beatles had rented. Oh, wow. How long were they here? Mm, Not I, long? I'm only tra- I tracking uh, that, yeah, okay. that <laughs> day and a half. <laughs> that, that day or two? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So and, you go there. So we go there and then it's announced that we're going to take acid. Yeah. I said, oh. The good shit. The good shit. The Owsley right. shit. No, that was not much better than that. Oh, really? <laughs> Absolutely. Straight out of Sandow's. <laughs> Where? Sandow's. Oh, yeah, really? The yeah. good, oh, the pharmaceutical. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and, that, and that was Crosby's, he had that? Um, yeah, yeah, but he'd gotten it from me. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were the source. I just, I got there. You right? knew the guy. Yeah, yeah. and you know, it's, it's the old dropper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The sugar sur- cube. Yeah, yeah. You could actually put it in the palm of your hand and wait 45 minutes. You and you go blast. blast off. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> we've all done this deed, and I'm looking at everybody sitting at this big lunch thing, and they yeah. shouldn't be doing that. Yeah, man. But that's kind of a, a judgment I'm not going to call. Yeah. And finally, Crosby came and found me. Yeah. For some reason, he said, Fonda, you got to go talk to George. I said, oh, no, is he trying to lose it? Well, he, he thinks he's dying. <laughs> I said, well, Cros, that's what this drug is all about, yeah. you know. And your brain's trying to stop the effect. Right. But actually, it's you're cutting loose. Yeah, you know, and you're going to go on a freewheeling yeah. little tour Just of your brain. It, handle <laughs> it. Yeah. <laughs> and handle it. Yeah. <laughs> So I went down to talk to George. Yeah. George was sitting with John at this table in an outside area. We yeah. were disregarding the screaming kids. I said, we've got to prove that we're here and they're not. Right. <laughs> so I went down. There were, I think, oh, I think kids I was there? the oldest yeah, guy there, yeah. right? That's why I'm sent on this right. journey of yeah, go, to Manzanar with George. Yeah, you know, go take care of George. Out. He's flipping out. He's flipping. Yeah. And I went down and I said, George, you know, when you take this drug... What happens is it's all cutting loose and your brain doesn't want that. Yeah. So your brain's hanging on and telling you, I'm dying to make you stop. Yeah. But don't do that. Just take breaths. Just relax. Look, George, I know what it's like to be dead. Yeah. 
<laughs> Believe me. Yeah. I've, I've, I've died. My heart has stopped yeah. three times. So I lost too much blood. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you, it's just really cool. Uh-huh. There's nothing. Oh, no, there's no light. There's no tunnel. There's no people. Right. It's just nothing. And it's really nice. Uh-huh. And um, I'm here to tell you about it. So just let it go because I know what it's like to be dead. All right. You know, I, I mean, when I was a boy in my life, things were basically all right. Yeah. But, um, you know, they were, everything was right. But this was a mistake. Yeah, It was an accident. Yeah. Although my family thought I tried to commit suicide, George, I hadn't. It, yeah. it was a stupid Stupid accident for a little boy. I mean, mm-hmm. everything was, I was just a little boy, but in, and everything was all right. But, and Lennon looked at me and he said, What the fuck do you mean? Who put all that shit in your head? You know, I know what it's like to be dead. You're making me feel like I've never been born. I looked at him, I was far out. <laughs> and I let it go. And the next year out comes Revolver with She Said, I know what it's like to be Oh, dead. there you go. I know what it's like to be sad. And you're making me feel like I never, when I was a boy, everything was right. So to be part of a Beatles song. Man, wow. man, you landed. Right? Well, the, I mean, yeah, that's that's pretty amazing. But, you know, you also directed Easy Rider. So. Well, I know. Uh, I hired Hopper to direct oh, yeah, it. Yeah. And that part that I hired him is what really pissed him off. <laughs> he you, thought he should have hired me. But you wrote it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so like I you mean, know. Dennis did some very clever stuff in there. He um, did all the stuff with Jack talking about Venusians, sure, man. and all that. Yeah, uh, basically, the rest of it was so like ad lib. But if you're doing sixty five, sixty five, you're doing the Sandoz acid. Mm-hmm. So you know that's that's before the ship blows open down here. It's before it's before the what sixty eight, sixty nine, where everybody's doing it. Right, you're ahead yeah. of the curve. Oh uh, yeah, I, were you doing work? Were you dealing with Leary or Keezy or any of those guys? I I knew Keezy, I knew Leary, but I really wasn't on the same wavelength. Uh-huh. I, I was closer to Keezy than I was to Leary. Yeah, in terms of sort of like get out in it, not don't hole up. Yeah, <laughs> get out and be out and right. do it. Yeah, right. Yeah, you know, don't cause it anything. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and I was all for that. And when I had learned that I want to do this as a job, that means acting. I thought you meant acid. No, no, as a job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it was a trip yeah. for me to get there. It wasn't just because my dad was in it at all. Right, sure. He never said one word to me about that or anything right. else. Yeah. It was my discovery that, oh, I really like this. Yeah. In, in terms of wrangling what was going on in the culture and, and, and sort of like, I, I, I have to assume that you didn't realize that, that Easy Rider was going to blow up like it did, right? No, I just knew that I was going to make money with it because it wouldn't cost me a lot to make that was, that and, it was, was it? Uh, and i thought that the tale was really commercial visually yeah. commercial yeah oh yeah sure yeah. man yeah the road and, story well yeah i mean i i i was in toronto ontario yeah uh, and i was up promoting the film that nicholson had written called the trip that corman directed it was about taking lsd yeah dealing with press so i have a custom made for a uh, double-breasted suit yeah um Custom shirt, yeah. Hermes tie, really looking fine. Uh-huh. No shoes and no socks. Yeah. So I sit in a room <laughs> in a chair. Yeah. There's lights. Yeah. And people come into the room. Yeah. They either talk to me yeah. or, or take me for a radio, whatever it is, right? Uh-huh. The first thing they come into the room, I'm just decked out to the nines. Yeah. And sit, whoa. They see the bare feet, and that stops it, and they lose their interview. It becomes my interview. Yeah. I can say what the fuck I want. <laughs> Promote know. the film, blah, 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 and then next. And I knew that was the trick. Yeah. Because they couldn't handle that image. Why doesn't he have any shoes or socks? It overtakes their mind. It's, you know, it's yeah, like, right. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Um, and so the first day uh, I was there, there was a lunch with 1,200 people, maybe a bit more. Uh-huh. And they were all distributors and exhibitors Yeah, in Canada. And I was there with at the AIP table, which was you know what it was. And up there was a, a big uh, honor table with all the VIPs on it mm-hmm. and then a dais. And they'd been talking and I'm kind of checking everything out. People are looking at my feet, of course. Yeah. And... Uh, this little short guy comes up and gets on the mic and, yeah. and he's, he's, um, uh, LBJ's, um, guy in the motion picture. He was the head of the motion picture association of America. Right. 
Jack Valenti. Oh, he was then. He was back then. He yeah, just, he he just a began. Long, oh, okay. He was introducing himself. Oh yeah. Okay. He says, you know, and, I'm the guy. Yeah, I'm the guy. Yeah. And looking down at me on the floor, he says, "It's time we stop making movies about." And he, this is sounding like evangelical shit, right? Yeah. The type we stop making movies about motorcycles, sex, and drugs. And more movies like Dr. Doolittle, which cost $27 million. And he started his, his little launch by saying, my, my friends, and you are my friends. He said it twice. Yeah. Why? I don't know. Uh-huh. But I'm there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. Second time. Oh, maybe they didn't, he didn't think we heard him. <laughs> and so that's my, my tour. I go back to my motel, which was called the Lakeshore Motel at that time, a real seedy joint. <laughs> I said, so, no more sex, drugs, and motorcycles. Far out. <laughs> Fuck that guy. <laughs> yeah. That's my, <laughs> now I have a job, which is signing these black and white eight by tens. Uh huh. And we didn't have post-its, so everything had a little piece of paper. This guy owns 16 theaters. He's got two daughters. And now I would say, you know, what, whoever to ever and best wishes or yeah, love yeah. or peace. Right. Peter Fonda. <laughs> and then it came one of these eight by tens come, comes up and I'm looking at it and I know what the picture is in that eight by 10 format yeah. in the middle there's maybe two inches of fully silhouetted motorcycle with two guys on it. You can't see who they are because yeah. the sun's bouncing off. What we're doing is riding. It's me packing Bruce Dern and riding it along the cement trail in uh, Venice beach. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a trick because it right. looks like we're riding on sand. Right. But, you know, I I looked at that and I thought, who in marketing pulled this as a, something for me what to sign? What was it from? You know, uh, dear Betty, <laughs> um, best wishes, Peter Fonda. She's going, where the hell is he? You know, <laughs> what movie was it from? It was from Wild Angels. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. I looked at it and bingo, that's it. It's not a movie about a hundred Hell's Angels on a Hell's Angels funeral. Uh-huh. It's two guys riding across John Ford's West. Yeah, right, rest. Oh, God. and they're going east. Yeah, they're going east. Where are they going east? Oh, yeah, journey to the east. That's a little Herman Hesse nod. That's cool. Yeah. Going east. They're going to Florida to retire. And um, okay, that's what happens. They get there, and I'm, I've got these guys on motorcycles, of course. Yeah, and they get there, and they get whacked. Right. Because they don't look right. Yeah. They got long hair. Right. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's beautiful. Now I have to back it up to make it work. Right. And then I got it back to the beginning where we're bringing from Mexico, we're bringing a white powder. We don't say what it is. Right. I don't want the moralist to have the roughest time deciding about that. And you what did, that but you didn't name it in your mind either. Like, no. White powder. It was white powder. Right. Dennis probably uh, promised me it would be real coke, but it was powdered sugar. Man, that shit burns. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And your nose no good. <laughs> you know, and the camera's on. You go, whoa. <laughs> Pin my eyeballs. Yeah. And um, at, at any rate, that was the point. And uh, after I got it all together with the beginning, the middle, and an end, yeah. and the journey, yeah. and what we do and what we can't do, we can't go and eat in, in restaurants, we can't... We're not allowed to be in motels. Yeah. And all this shit. All this. It's like racial pro- profiling. Sure. And we're going to see what's happening on Amer- in America. Yeah. And I knew what that last bit. I knew from the oh, beginning what that. I was going to do at the end. That guy in that truck, man. Yeah, but you know the 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 idea. I and it, I knew that this was a big hit. Yeah. I'd thrown sevens. Yeah. And then I threw him between my legs. Yeah, I was still seven. Over my back, in the tub. It didn't matter. Blew up. I, I, I called up Hopper. It was 4.30 in the morning in Toronto. Yeah. And I called him up and I said, listen to this. And I, I had wakened him. I know that. Oh, yeah. But That's I surprising. Also, he wasn't up? <laughs> uh, well, uh, that part I can't. I, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. This is not a call. I, it seemed like a guy didn't sleep much for me. So I, yeah, <laughs> I, um, I told him the story. Yeah. He said, that's really great, man. What are you going to do with it? I said, well, I figure you direct it, I'll produce it. We'll both write it and star, and then we can save some money that way. You want me to direct it? Sure, man. I mean, you have the passion. You know you know framing better than I do. This is, you, know, you understand camera better than I do? Absolutely. You, you're set for this. We can do this. Oh, man. I'm so glad you called me because I was never going to talk to you again. We don't want to necessarily go back and explain that. That's something I'll write, be writing about. <laughs> What happened? <laughs> no, he, yeah, he stormed out. We had a. He wanted to direct this album that I was going to make. Uh, Hugh Masekela was my my guy, and 
Bruce. A record? Yeah, a record. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh, he wanted to direct the album. Uh -huh. Direct an album? You mean produce it? You don't know. <laughs> this is what he says. Come see my house. I want to direct it. I said, Dennis, you don't direct albums. You know, you produce them, you arrange them. Right. That's what you don't. You play on them, but right. you don't direct them. Yeah. No, no, man. I mean, then he started blowing off. <laughs> Everybody steals my ideas. I can't believe it. Everybody steals my. I'm thinking, what? <laughs> Everybody says, I can't. But, but, but on and on until yeah. I finally I have to stop this shit. Yeah, yeah. So on the floor, I had this uh, little. It was a reel to reel. Sony that looked like it was an Ampex, it's yeah. a higher grade. Yeah. And I just picked that circle up and said, hey, Hoppy, yeah. I threw it on the parquet floor, it broke. I said, when you can fix that, yeah. you can direct an album. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> I can't believe you, you, did you see what you just did? I mean, you're a fucking child, man. I mean, I mean, think of man, dig, man, 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 you dig it? You're, that's, I can't talk to you, you're a fucking child. I'm, I, I'm never going to talk to you again. I'm, I'm out of here. Yeah. I, and he, he walked out and I'm, no, I don't want to talk to you. You're a fucking child. I can't handle this. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm walking away. I never want to talk to you again. <laughs> No, until I'm so right. glad you called me because I was <laughs> never going to talk to you again. That's hilarious. <laughs> Did you guys stay friends? Uh, things became a, a, a tad stretched. Yeah. He was out of control during the filming. Yeah. But he stayed out of control for a while. But when he leveled off, did you ever reunite? I tried many times. Oh, really? Thought I, thought I was successful from time to time. Yeah. But... Uh, I guess when you have a... He claimed that I cheated him. Oh. Oh, on the... And, and I have tape of him being interviewed he said some event he, he was in a cadillac mm. with his then wife and he said yeah finally cheating me out of millions and millions and millions oh. of dollars you you the microphone you couldn't see that i held up three fingers so, yeah <laughs> yeah at any rate i thought well great if he helps me find it i'll get a million and a half out of that <laughs> <laughs> go look for are it. you fucking kidding me and he believed it. and he said that he and he alone wrote easy rider oh so it just became a business Megalomania problem. Megalomania yeah. played heavy on it. It was too bad. And the blow, too, I imagine, for a while. Oh, yeah. But I mean, we tried to get him to stop drinking. Yeah. So he was going to AA meetings. Sure. But he had a bag of Coke in his pocket. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Solving one problem. Right. Then, <laughs> then he, he got rid of that problem, yeah. too. Yeah. But the adventure, man. I mean, the fact that you kind of you know blew out this. You did Easy Rider. You changed the face of, uh, of filmmaking and culture and everything else. And then you're the guy. You're that guy. <laughs> so then you're sort of like, you're the biker guy. Yeah. Well, you're the next film I did, I I bought the script. Yeah. And I didn't know, I was, I, I was going to produce it and act in it. Yeah. And it was called The Hired Hand. Yeah. And as I began reading it more and more, I saw more and more of the stuff that, yeah. I'd, that I'd want to see. And then I'll have them do this and I'll have them do that. That'll really look great. We'll shoot over here and that'll be good because I know it's there. Yeah. And suddenly I stopped and I said, wait a second. I'm the producer. I can't tell the director how to direct. <laughs> right. Oh, my God. I'm going to have to direct this thing because yeah. I could visually see it. Right. And it, it, first reading, it was a visual imprint on me that it was as strong as the visual imprint of the story I made up in Toronto called Later Easy Rider. Yeah. We didn't know what to call it at first. Right. So, yeah, so but it's interesting, though, that the Western was still around. And, and Warren Oates, you did a lot of movies with Warren Oates, huh? Oh, I loved him. He was a great guy. Was he? Really fine actor. Yeah, great. great very easygoing, funny guy. We got along so well, and uh, he didn't have to die. No. Now, like, what about Nicholson? Are you guys still friends? We are. I don't see him enough. I, in fact, have to call him and just check on him and see how he's doing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because, like, I imagine, like, you know, Harry Dean's gone. I know. Man. Well, as we said earlier, yeah. well, as we get older, we start yeah. losing more friends. But I like to know, like, I always ask guys, like, you, you know, you, but there are guys that you stayed friends with, you know, throughout the time, huh? You know, like, through the whole ride. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, I'm, yeah. You know, I still know McGuinn and Crosby. Oh, yeah. He was, yeah. I had, I talked to Crosby at my old house. Yeah. Yeah, for a couple hours. I think he would have stayed for the whole day if I, if I would have let him. Great guy. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he's a real sweetheart. Man. And McGuinn is too. And, you know, McGuinn, yeah. Uh, How about Tom McGuinn? You can talk to him anymore? I haven't seen him in, in quite a few years. That was a pretty big uh, movie, I'm, wasn't it? 92. Uh, 92. Um, well, it was artistic. Yeah. And that has its own story of, <laughs> that I don't want to get into. Man. <laughs> uh, the, the nothing's for the PTS part of it, but <laughs> just in this book that I'm writing. You're writing a book now? Yeah. So and Second um, memoir? Yeah, because a lot's happened since 98. <laughs> sure. What's the angle? Uh, well, just in the what I'm talking about in PTS yeah, starts sure, off sure, with uh, the title, 
objects in mirror are closer than they appear. <laughs> it's all about your past. Yeah. And the, the motto for PTS people yeah. who are really fucked up by it is the only good day was today. Yeah. Did you try the EMDR? I tried everything. Yeah. Um, how does it affect you? What are the manifestations of it for you on a day to day basis? What PTSD? I mean, what? You never, I, I never know. Um, I can see a commercial yeah. that does a certain thing uh -huh. and it will, I, I just break down crying. Uh huh. Full on. Full on. And, uh, and I've been after this for quite a while. I just didn't understand what I had. I thought I was nuts, and I better keep it to myself because they're liable to put the net on me. But it's also a sensitivity, right? I mean, it's like a, a, like an oversensitivity almost, right? Or is it more of like, you don't know, like it just a, a trigger thing? Uh, something triggers it. Ah, uh, yeah. And uh, as I say, it could be a commercial. Here. could be something I see on the street. Yeah. could be a phone call I get. Or anything I hear, you know, if it deals in a certain thing that, that I get caught on. And, yeah. Uh, it it's not a barbless hook. Yeah. So so you're going to discuss like so you, once you found out that's what you had, you kind of kind of ran that through. You backloaded into your whole sort of past and and saw. Well, I, well, maybe I already that. I already was dealing with my past. Yeah. Uh, every day without understanding why. Right. Now I understood understand why. You, why you were hung up on the things you were hung up on? No, how I got hung up. Oh. I mean, I didn't look at those things as hanging me up. Yeah. Um, I wondered what was going wrong with my mother. Yeah. Later, when I was trying to res resolve certain crises in my life yeah. about the mechanical rape, um, I talked to people who knew my mother during yeah. that particular time. And these two women, uh, Eulalia Chapin and Marion Parker, mm -hmm. and uh, they explained a lot of stuff that went on and, and, and what happened about your mother's darkness about my mother's darkness and my father's short-sightedness uh apparently he used to cuff me on the head or slap me yeah when i didn't finish my meal right hence my going to johns hopkins to have uh, look for a tapeworm right <laughs> brilliant people man yeah man. of course it was 1946 so i guess i cut a little last slack there but not a lot because it fucked me up but do you think how much of that you know like this the psychological trauma do you think sort of like uh you know compelled you to sort of you know push the envelope with you know with drugs and doing all the other shit well, I, I figured I, I was bent already, so what right. could I lose? Are you looking for solutions, you think, in retrospect? Uh, no, but on my third trip, I, I really expanded my brain a lot and got yeah. in there. But I still didn't see the causal effect right, of what, right. what, what was causing it. I just, it, I mean, it took me until I was 15 or 16 to realize what this terrible nightmare that I have every night was. Yeah. Night that, terrors every and, night. And that, that was the, uh, the tapeworm experience. Mm -hmm. tapeworm. Really? And gunshot and sure. mother's death and, yeah, sure. and so forth. I remember on my 50th birthday, my, my sister Jane wrote me uh, a fax. Yeah. I was making a movie in, in Switzerland. And I came back, great hotel, the Bauerlock. I came yeah. back to the hotel and there was sitting in the fax machine this fax from my sister. Yeah. And it was a poem. Uh huh. And um, she she does the the glass half full, the glass half empty. Uh huh. And it was a, kind of a cool little poem. Yeah. But my response to that was my 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 sister didn't get it. My class was overflowing with this myriad of colors just <laughs> all over the fucking place, you know. And I was going, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And uh, I never thought of it as halfway out. I was all the way in. And, well, yes. why is this doing this to them? <laughs> Pretty it's far all... out colors. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it was overflowing, and it wasn't half full or half empty. Uh, and uh, maybe I was half empty, but I felt I was full. Yeah, man. Uh, and uh, do, you, do you get along with her still? Yeah. That's good. Yeah, she's so uh, into what she, uh, she does. Yeah. And um, busy. She's busy a lot. Yeah. You know, she's got her children and she's got grandchildren now. But no tension um, with you. You're just, you're cool. Yeah. That's good. We have to be. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I have to think that way. I thought you were great in this uh, in this little movie, even though you only had a couple scenes. It's always nice to see you, and you always pop up places. You know what's interesting about the, that fact? That 
that moment when I meet Plummer? Christopher, the, yeah. because I've known him in real life sure. since I was 18. Right. I was able to to throw my hands into that yeah. situation. And he just instinctually, he's this great Shakespearean actor. Sure, man. You know, yeah. the, the best in the Americas on Filmer stage. Yeah. And he wraps in where it's just so, I'm using this history I have sure. knowing him for so long. Yeah. Not that I hung out with him a lot. But your old man did? Not really. No, no. No, my first stepmother knew oh, him. Oh, okay. And anyway, he was a wonderful young guy, a lunatic. I loved it. Yeah. And so here I am. I'm seeing this fellow that I knew, and I just wrap my arms around him. It's, it's just, uh, you can see it on film. It's a, it's a, uh, there's something about the way we hold on. We just greet each other yeah. that makes you go, huh. Yeah. You relax. I know. I Everything's that. fine. You know, I've been waiting for this bottle of wine. Now's a good time to open yeah. that wine. And then we're down there vaping up. You yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking, this is so far out. Yeah, man. I mean, I can feel that. Like, there's the, a looseness to it, you know? The finest Shakespearean actor in the Americas on stage or screen yeah. is selling pot to Easy Rider. <laughs> there you go. Whoa. That's the hook of the scene How right about there. about that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. man. And you and like your health is good, everything else. Yeah, my health is great, you know. Yeah, man. But um, my mental health is questionable. But I, you know, I I don't find as much darkness. Sure, I'm getting um, used to it in a sense, so it's easier for me to stop myself from getting yeah. caught. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's still barbed hooks. We're sure. not catching release, and we should be catching release. But I do have a, a great deal of empathy for our soldiers. Are fighting men and women. Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't see a friend next to me get his head blown off. Yeah. I didn't lose an arm or leg. I almost lost my life, but, you know, yeah. I dodged many bullets. Sure. Uh, and so maybe I don't have the right to have a tough time. I mean, I never had to worry about where I was going to eat or sleep. Yeah. yeah. But, but you still, know. you got a, you got a problem. You're dealing with it. Yeah. Um, I, I, I now know. Yeah, about the the tape worm thing. Yeah, yeah, and I found out that the reason my mother was there, she was getting a hysterectomy, because she was a bleeder. She had heavy, heavy periods, and she was, I now know, in postpartum. Oh yeah, those are phrases you, you don't know. Uh, you know, and I I took psychology in college. I, I figured I better find out some more about me because something's missing. So that, that was what they tracked the uh, the suicide to the postpartum, or I think that that's part of it. Wow, and and part of of my dad, not, yeah. you know, wanting to divorce her. Mm. Oh, he wanted to. He wanted he out. Wanted to marry a younger woman, my yeah. first stepmother, yeah. whom I adore. Yeah, yeah. And I could look at that whole thing as saying she's the reason my mother killed herself. Right. But it's not that. Sure. Yeah. And uh, and I could go spit on my father's ashes. Yeah. But that's not it either. Right. Uh, it's trying to understand that and forgive that. Yeah. But before you can get to forgiving that, mm. you have to forgive yourself. Yeah. How are you doing with that? That's the hardest part. Yeah, man. Well, you know, you seem pretty good. Hey, I'm an actor. I act like I seem pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know, I, you, you heard it. I, you know, how are you doing? I'm alive. <laughs> the alternative really sucks. Yeah. Although inevitable at this yeah. particular moment, unacceptable. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're alive. It was great seeing you. I don't want to hold you up because no. I know you got to go get pictures or whatever. Yeah. I was told hard out and then it's only a matter of time before come on, someone comes to the door. And, yeah. Hold on. I'll get that. It might yeah. be my lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for talking, Peter. My pleasure. Thank you. That was in and out of the Peter Fonda brain. Me uh, bouncing around in the Peter Fonda brain, in Peter Fonda land. It was good to see him. Support for today's show comes from Ben and Jerry's, which is known for creating euphoric ice cream with quirky, unique flavor combinations, all with delicious chunks and swirls throughout. And now with new Mooforia flavors, digging into a bowl of your favorite treat is even sweeter because at 140 to 160 calories per serving, Mooforia is the lightest way to enjoy all the euphoria of Ben and Jerry's. Available in three amazing flavors, chocolate milk and cookies, caramel cookie fix, and PB dough. Try them all. Go to store.benjerry.com to have new Mooforia light ice cream delivered to you. Okay? I'm going to play some dirty, distorted... Barely tuned guitar now. Mm-hmm. 